Hi, uh, I'm Dr. Elizabeth Seng from the Health Research Council for the American Psychological Association's Division 38, which is the Health Psychology Division. Um, I'm here today talking with Dr. Beverly Thorne, who is the Professor and Chair of Psychology at the University of Alabama and the Director of the University of Alabama Pain Management Team. She conducts clinical research regarding pain management. So thank you so much for being willing to come and talk to us today. My pleasure. So um, it's kind of, I don't know that a lot of people would think about psychologists treating pain. So uh, how can psychologists help to treat pain? So one barrier that we have to overcome immediately is people feel like if they're referred to a psychologist because they have pain, it means in their head that physicians don't believe their pain is real. Yeah. And so the first barrier we have to overcome is make sure that they understand that we understand their pain is real yeah. and it is stress related because pain is a huge stressor. And so usually the first time that I talk to somebody with chronic pain, I say, um, would you like to learn some stress management techniques that would help you deal with the stress of having pain? Instead of, I'm going to examine your head or something like that. What I do as a clinical health psychologist is I help people deal with chronic illnesses and the stress of chronic illness. And we have lots of good techniques, psychologists do, to help people deal more, more productively with chronic illnesses so that they can live their life despite the chronic illness. Mm -hmm. So the purpose is really to help people live their lives better. The main purpose that I, as a psychologist, have in helping people with chronic pain is to help them improve their quality of life. And if their pain level decreases in the process of doing that, and it often does, that's extra icing on the cake. Um, but one of the things I do at the end of the treatment is ask them, knowing what you know now and knowing how much your pain has decreased or not, is it worth the time investment? And I would say 99% of the people say, absolutely. absolutely. So I know that you do a lot of work with patients in rural settings. Mm -hmm. So how might treating pain be different in a rural setting compared to a suburban or urban setting? I think the two main differences that we see are issues of accessibility, which I'll tell you about in a second, and also issues regarding um, the type of chronic pain that we encounter, and I'll start with that one. People in rural settings tend to have very physically demanding jobs and physically dangerous jobs, and therefore we have individuals who have chronic pain as a result of a very serious accident that has ended their ability to work, oftentimes maimed them, and um, traumatized them. Yeah. And so we deal with trauma associated with, with the accident as well, as uh, having the chronic pain. And then often, because they don't have funds, often are, they have reduced funds for health care and reduced accessibility, they um, don't get it treated properly at the acute stage or when it just happens. And that's one of many reasons why acute pain turns into chronic pain. So um, there tend to be more um, cases where the person has just used up their body or had it mangled, frankly, and they are living with chronic pain and they're also living without a job because yeah. they can't use their body for their job anymore. They also drive um, incredibly long distances to get to health care. It's not unusual for them to drive 45 minutes to an hour and a half, um, moving over several counties to get to a rural satellite clinic. Okay. So those are the two main differences that I see. In terms of the kinds of things they're dealing with, um, it's very similar to other chronic pain. Um, so, can cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a psychological intervention, help people's pain in these rural settings? Absolutely, and I wouldn't be sitting here today if, <laughs> if, if it couldn't, and it does, and um, both rural and urban and suburban, what we find that when we do a cognitive behavioral intervention, and what I do is a 10-week group intervention with other patients who have chronic pain, uh, when we do that intervention, three main things happen. 
their pain levels go down a small but significant amount. Their interference in their physical daily function. So how much their goes pain down. interferes with yes. what they do. That's right. So the, pain, the interference that pain has on their daily lives goes down. So they increase functionality. They increase the ability to do stuff in their life. And, um, well, actually, I'd say four things happen. The, their depression levels and anger goes down, which is very, very important because those are quite high in many patients with chronic pain. And then their quality of life goes up. So all of these things have been shown repeatedly to be demonstrated with, with cognitive behavioral therapy for chronic pain. So, and the cognitive behavioral therapy, is, it's for chronic pain specifically. Correct. So you're seeing people's depression go down, which you aren't necessarily specifically targeting. Correct. In a treatment for pain. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Now some of the principles of cognitive behavioral therapy for chronic pain are similar to cognitive behavioral therapy for depression. So it's not surprising that their depression goes down. But one of the surprises that patients have is they say, at the, toward the end of the treatment, they go, wow, this is about my life. It's not just about my pain. Or they'll say, wow, I'm starting to believe that emotions are just as important as the physical pain itself. Yeah. And when they start making those realizations, you say, yes, they got it. Yeah. And they're going to run with it. Yeah. So you're almost helping them really get back to their life Absolutely. rather than focusing on the pain. Absolutely. Okay. Rather than being overwhelmed and, and uh, owned by the pain. Um, so, one of the things that you've mentioned in some of your research in a rural population is low literacy. People who can't read very well or who don't read very much in their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you adapt your cognitive behavioral therapy program that you've been talking about for pain to work with the lower literacy patients in rural settings? This is a really interesting question because in doing the adaptations, what I've discovered is that we are all, as professionals, very, healthcare professionals, very comfortable with fancy words, medical terms, psychological jargon, and we think nothing of rolling it off our tongues. But uh, the general population, whether they have high literacy or low literacy, doesn't talk like that. And um, it's really best not to use those words. Yeah. So one of the things that we did to begin with is just simplify our terminology. And we try to avoid three-syllable words. We try to avoid three-syllable written word. And we try to avoid three-syllable words in our group sessions. And uh, that's one way to simplify for lower literacy. But I also think it's a great way for us to be interacting with the general public. We use a treatment workbook, a patient workbook, and what we've done is we have supplemented with illustrations, pointed uh, illustrations, and gone easy on the words. We increase our text size, which most people appreciate whether they have low literacy or not. It's um, always a little intimidating when you see those um, pieces of paper that come with your medications. Oh, and yeah. just list all of the little things. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you have to get a microscope out. Yeah. Yes, yes. So we, big words. And we use, in, in our group treatment, we use flip charts like crazy. So we're constantly talking to the patients, and as we're talking to them, we're writing down what they say to show how this is related to that, and then what do you think about this? And they really like the flip charts as well. One of the things we know about patients with chronic pain, any patient with chronic pain, is they have a hard enough time concentrating. So to make it easier on them, to make the words easier, to make the process easier, is really um, appreciated. Yeah. So when you have chronic pain, it may not be that you can't focus. It's just hard. It's, it takes so much energy yeah. to focus. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, what did you find um, in your qualitative study where you talked to patients that you think was most important to help psychologists understand how to help people with pain in rural areas. So let me make a distinction between quantitative research and qualitative research. Quantitative research is when a researcher will have numbers and values, and so we're all, uh, all of us researchers loves number, love numbers and values, and it could be a blood test value, or it could be 
your answers on a questionnaire. Yeah. That's how they your pain score is. Right, exactly. Okay. That's qualitative. Qualitative research is when we actually talk to the patient. And we have a structured interview, so we ask them to specifically talk about, in this case, what were the most important aspects of the treatment mm -hmm. and what were the most difficult aspects of the treatment. And what we found when we talked to the patients is that, first of all, the most important aspects of the treatment started with feeling like they were believed, feeling like they were valued and listened to, being with other people who have chronic pain so that they don't have to put up any pretense, and um, feeling like we were hearing their story and pushing them, but gently, pushing them along. Those are what researchers call common factors in psychotherapy research. Um, you have to get to that base before you get to second base. Yeah. If you don't get to first base with those common factors, you're not going to. I could have the fanciest, best, most wonderful manual in the world, yeah. and if my patients don't think that I believe them and care about them, it doesn't matter. It's kind of a non-starter. It's a non-starter. So the second piece is, um, and this was was for both psychoeducation groups because we offer just education as well as the cognitive behavioral therapy in both groups we teach them about how the brain processes pain we teach them that the brain is what determines whether you feel pain and how much pain you feel that you have and we also teach them about the fact that the brain not only receives pain signals but coming down from the brain, it can actually make pain signals more, mm -hmm. worse, or it can make pain signals uh, less. So things that your brain is doing affect how badly you feel pain. Absolutely. And the two things we talk about are the thoughts and the feelings center. So what you tell yourself, oh my god, this is the most terrible thing in the world that's going to kill me makes actually makes your pain worse if you say i've been through this before i know how to deal with a pain uh, flare-up i know i have some techniques i can use it actually makes your experience of pain better okay. we call those gate closers because this is the gate control theory of pain and um, it's been proven that we uh, it, it's not a real gate in your spinal cord but the brain is making a decision about how many pain signals or how few signals come in, how few signals. Then the same thing happens with emotion. If we're consumed with anger, it opens the gate. Yeah. And we have more pain signals come in. And we feel more pain. Yeah. And if we learn how to be quiet and calm um, and less depressed and less angry, despite the pain, we have fewer pain signals. So that was a very, very important piece to both sets of groups, both treatment conditions. And what was interesting to me is the patients said they had never, ever been told this. These are people that have had chronic pain conditions for 20 years. Yeah. They'd never been told this. And they felt like it was a life-changing piece of information that they wished they would have had. Yeah. So they this information that was part of just a general part of both your treatment as well as your education group was potentially really, really important for right. education. Right. right. That kind of information in a supportive environment, many people can take that and run with it in terms of helping themselves manage their pain. Mm -hmm. And we also believe that people who are what we call clinically depressed or have a serious issue of depression or anxiety or trauma, or just um, beaten down by the whole prospect of chronic illness, if we add to that some what we call cognitive behavioral skills training, we can help lift them up a little bit so that they can then take their skills and manage their lives a little bit better. Um, in this study where you were talking to patients about the program, one of the things the patient said facilitated or helped the treatment for pain was that it felt like they were back in school. Mm -hmm. That was a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, but then one of the one of the barriers, one of the things that made it harder for them to engage in the treatment was that the homework could be difficult for them. Mm 
Um, how do you put those two pieces of information together from your study? Mm -hmm. And how do you use that information going forward? Right. So um, now many of these folks have what we call low educational attainment. So they may not have even graduated from high school. And even if they have graduated from high school, and this isn't true for all of them by any means, um, but we are targeting our research toward this population that has lots of different um, disparities, as we call them, or inequalities. And one of them is educational opportunity. So many of these folks didn't graduate from high school. At the end of treatment, we give them a certificate. And I was astounded at how meaningful that is to them. I've had people in tears at the end of group. We don't tell them we're going to get a certificate. But I've had people in tears saying, I've never gotten a certificate for anything. Certainly didn't get a high school certificate. Yeah. I'm going to frame this. So I think that's part of what that comment was. I felt like I was in school. Plus, we used that flip chart. So we're always writing stuff down. And what did you think about this week? Excellent. How does that relate to this? I really like that. And so, in a way, it's sort of instructional, like the teacher. Hopefully, it's very uh, positive and friendly, the way we do it. But it is sort of instructional. Yeah. On the other hand, in the cognitive and behavioral therapy group, we send them home with activities to um, work on mm -hmm. during the week to build their skills. And homework is difficult for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> and homework is especially difficult for people who are beaten down and who are depressed and who are anxious and who may not have high literacy skills, especially if the homework is written, and um, who have lots of stressors in their life due to poverty, for example. You know, if they're trying to figure out where they're going to get their next meal, literally, they're not going to stop and do your relaxation exercises necessarily. What we've learned from this is at first, we did away with, uh, in, in cognitive therapy, there's something called the column technique, where you um, write down what your thought is, and what your emotional reaction is, and what your, how your body was reacting, etc. And we did away from, did, did away with these columns. Uh, we turned it into a circle. And that was much easier for them to understand. Um, because Many people think in a circular fashion rather than this goes to this goes to this. That was kind of confusing. They still weren't doing the homework. So now what we do is we give them a CD at the end of every session, which is a recap of what we talked about in the session. And then we tell them, go listen to this CD. That's your homework. You can you're, feel free to jot down anything you want. But listen to the CD at least once during the week and think, feel, and act based on what you heard in the group today. You don't have to write anything down. Think, feel, act. When you give them those key words, it, it's easier to, you know, it's easier for them to catch themselves and go, oh yeah, I did have that thought. Okay, what was my feeling? Okay, well, how, did I, how did I respond? Or how did I act? Sure. Maybe I can do that differently. Yeah. You can do that without having them do these fancy columns. Yeah. So you don't need those fancy columns. Not and all of that writing, necessarily, that's correct, to get people to change those thoughts and behaviors that help them manage their cognitive. That's correct. It is interesting to me, though, that uh, not infrequently we'll have a patient with a low reading level come in and say, I wrote down a few thoughts, and it's beautiful, and it's eloquent, and the other people go, can I have a coffee in that? So I don't want you to get the impression that these people can't write or don't write, but they've got uh, so many challenges in their lives. To make it as easy as possible for them to do this kind of work is what we're about. So where do you want to go with this work in the future? Well, um, right now I'm currently working on an extension of the studies that you've been ask me, asking me about. And so we are at federally qualified health centers in the state of Alabama. Uh, most of the state of Alabama is rural, <laughs> and we're at federally qualified health centers that are specifically designed and supported by the government for people with low income. And we are doing a larger clinical trial to uh, look to see if there are subtle differences between the kinds of treatment approaches that we're trying, education groups, and also cognitive behavioral therapy groups, compared to medical treatment as usual. 
is there a value added? And if there's a value added for these groups, um, is, there a, is there a kind of patient that benefits from one over the other? So for example, is somebody who's quite depressed going to benefit more from cognitive behavioral therapy than education? You have to have a lot of participants to be able to answer those subtle questions. And so right now, we're funded by the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, which is funded by the Affordable Care Act, to do a larger study so that we can a answer these subtle questions. And the next step is how do we make it sustainable? Because I can guarantee you that federally qualified health centers are not going to run out and hire full-time psychologists to do this work. We would love it if they did. They don't have the resources. Yeah. And those clinics, just like many, many, many healthcare systems still in the United States, are still ensconced in the biomedical treatment model where you've got pain, we find the cause, we cut it out, or we medicate it away. And if that doesn't work, we say, hmm, there must be something in your head. Yeah. And that is a shame. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Thorne, mm -hmm. for talking with us. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us. Um, I hope that this has given you a little bit of insight into how psychologists can help pain um, and the research that people are doing with APA's Division 38, or the Health Psychology Division.